Hello, everyone, and welcome to Ira's Afternoon at the Museum. I'm Janine Stanley, the Explorer Community Manager here at Ira Tech Corp, and we are a visual interpreting service for everyone who is joining us. We'd like to welcome all the folks out there on YouTube and on Zoom who are listening maybe on the phone on Zoom and who are watching us on YouTube. So Ira is, as I said, a visual interpreting service and it is accessed through a free smartphone app by blind and low vision folks, but really anybody can use Ira. And you will connect to a very well-trained agent who will describe things to you and assist you by getting you information about your environment. So today we have our first in a series of afternoons at the museum. And I will introduce your hosts for this. Um, today we have our host of our show is Stephanie Watts. Hello, Stephanie. Hi, Janine. Hi, everyone. Welcome. All right. And Stephanie is from Sacramento, California. Did I get that one right? That is correct. Right. Yes. And she is a retired counselor from the State Rehabilitation Program. She's also an IRA explorer, which is what we call our customers. And before we get started with Julia, her agent, who is also here with us today. Hi, Julia. Hello. Hi, everyone. We are going to say a couple quick words about things that are going on in the nation today. And we want to start out by sending our thoughts and prayers to the family of Jacob Blake and all that are connected with that very unfortunate situation. And uh, Stephanie, any, any other things that we'd like to talk about in terms of things going on around the country? Well, I also want to send thoughts and prayers to our friends in Cedar Rapids, uh, Iowa today, um, which is the museum we will be touring and um, again um, I, my heart goes out to you uh, there in Iowa and um, anybody else who has family and friends in any part of the country um, that is affected by the recent hurricane um, we're, we're in the hurricane season so there's no shortage of um, challenges you all face so um, my thoughts and prayers are with you and may you be well Absolutely. Thank you so much. Stephanie referred to the museum that we'll be looking at today, and that museum is the African American Museum of Iowa in Cedar Rapids, where they had a very devastating storm. Uh, I believe it was August 11th or so, uh, and that did quite a bit of damage. In fact, the museum itself is actually closed right now until further notice um, due to intermittent electricity and things like that. However, uh, we are lucky enough to get to look at its online content. And I'm gonna turn it over now to Stephanie to give you an afternoon at the museum. I feel like um, harp music should be playing in the background. Or <laughs> Maybe the Masterpiece teleport. Theater theme, right? <laughs> We're gonna teleport ourselves over to the um, African American Museum uh, in Iowa. And um, what I would like to share with you um, as an IRA explorer, the, we, as you know, we have Julia, the agent with us today, um, but the, the process would be that I would make a call and um, an agent would answer the call and I would then say, hi, um, I would like to uh, have your assistance to visit um, online the African American Museum of Iowa. And so it, that would be the process in a normal IRA explorer to agent call for those who are not familiar with IRA. Um, so I want to also share just briefly one of the thoughts I had in selecting Iowa is quite frankly, um, I don't know anything about Black history in Iowa, and that doesn't probably register much. Uh, to you because you, you have no way of knowing things I know or don't know about Black history, but I picked Iowa today because in my own fund of knowledge, I simply hadn't heard much about history in relation to Iowa. So I, I thought, well, let's try that one. And um, it's, I think, going to be a very interesting choice. I hope you enjoyed it as much as I have, and I'm happy to share it with you today. So 
Um, hi, Julia. I'm happy to partner with you today for this hi, tool. Hi, Stephanie. I'm also happy to be here, of course. <laughs> so we will, um, on this excursion, um, I don't know for the Trekkie fans out there if the right word is word is transport or teleport. But anyway, we're gonna we're gonna move ourselves through, uh, and we're going to land virtually in the museum lobby. And so, Julia, maybe you could tell me what's available, what exhibits um, are open and available for us today. Well, first of all, we have a statement from the executive director about what's going on in the country right now on our homepage here. And then after that, it appears there's a permanent exhibit that they have an online tour of, and the permanent exhibit is called Endless Possibilities. It's about the history of African Americans in Iowa. So where would you like to start? Uh, yes, let's, let's please read the statement. That would be helpful. Okay. This is updated in the beginning of June, June 6th. It says, Dear Iowans, the African American Museum of Iowa team and board have been deeply saddened and outraged by continued injustices against Black people in our country. In recent days, the museum has been the focus of an outpouring of support with offers of individual, community, and organizational collaboration. This is a clear message that what we do matters to communities across the state. The museum is uniquely poised to serve as a resource for many seeking historical perspectives, real answers, and social justice platforms. There are many people who were taken off guard by the most recent traumatizing murders of Black people by law enforcement. These instances of police brutality are only more examples of centuries of oppression. There has been a collective gasp of pain and outrage, as yet another video has become the witness for the unheard in our society. The exhaustive list of Black men, women, and children who have been victimized throughout the history of this country is not new, but now being seen through a new lens, one of authenticity and truth. The mission of the museum is to preserve, exhibit, and teach the African-American heritage of Iowa. Teaching includes exposing the past and recent injustices to impact the strides we can make today and tomorrow. We are weeks away from our annual Juneteenth celebration, which will take on added meaning this year. This year, we won't just be celebrating, but launching renewed efforts in the fight toward real justice and equality, armed with allies and voices that need to be heard. There has been a unified awakening of many Americans and global citizens to the atrocities faced by Black people today and over the last 400 years. History has demonstrated the injustices are many and the time of action long overdue. I am heartbroken but not hopeless. I pray for peace and justice in our land. We must demand it for the sake of all our children and their children. Whether you march, implore your legislature, kneel, or stand up to lawlessness, please do consider your own personal responsibility toward ensuring all people are treated with dignity and humanity. All lives don't matter until Black lives matter. Sincerely, Lanisha Cassell, who's the executive director of this museum. And Julia, thank you for pointing that out to me um, and to share with others on the uh, YouTube and Zoom. Uh, that is the kind of benefit we receive as IRA Explorers when we're partnering with our agents to uh, do such things as this tour, that they will observe things um, for uh, that might be in view if we were literally standing in the lobby of the museum. So thank you for sharing that. <clears throat> you want to jump into the exhibit? Yeah, let's, let's see what we have. Okay. So this permanent exhibit that they have online at the AMI, or AAMI rather, is called Endless Possibilities. And there's a description of the exhibit as a whole that says, Chase Iowa's African American, African American history from its origins in Western Africa to the present through slavery, the Civil War, the Underground Railroad, segregation, and the Civil Rights Movement. At the African American Museum of Iowa's permanent exhibit, Endless Possibilities. Along the journey, you'll explore the diversity of Western Africa, the torturous journey aboard a slave ship, the quest for freedom, the struggle for equality, and the unique history of African American communities across Iowa. And okay. then it looks like there's a series of exhibits, starting with a bit of a lobby exhibit here. You want to start there? All right, it looks like every exhibit begins with a quote as well. This one is from Bernice Jones in Narratives of African Americans in Iowa. It says, the saying I've always heard is bloom where you are planted. If it is in Iowa, there is a lot of room here for black people's accomplishments. 
It doesn't mean you can do it overnight. You have to stick with the stuff until you achieve the goal that you set in the first place. And so the, once we, we see that, um, are we pointed in the direction of several different um, exhibits or features within this exhibit? Is that yes. how it's laid out? Mm -hmm. So right after this quote, there is a photograph of what looks like the entrance to the exhibits with the first thing that really jumps out at me on the back wall is a mural. And the mural is called The Journey by Heather Wagner of Cedar Rapids. And there's a little description here that says, the mural portrays the journey of African Americans made from their roots in Africa to present day Iowa. The Midwest rolling hills and open sky are the backdrop. The journey begins in the bottom and the timeline crawls from the depths of slavery up the hills through the valleys until the tops of those hills are in sight, conquered and leaving the sky in open canvas, representing the future of Iowa's African Americans. Is she's the artist again, Heather is the name? Yeah, her name is Heather Wagner. Okay, and she's in Iowa? She's, she's from Iowa? It appears she's from Cedar Rapids, according to this. I can find you more information about her if you're interested. Mm -hmm. Let's see. I think it's nice that um, obviously they've they've got a local artist there, prominence, and um, I love the quote: "Bloom where you're planted." If you remember that. All right, Heather Wagner Designs is her, she has a portrait studio in Cedar Rapids, Iowa. And it looks like she has a gallery online and she's a painter. And a lot of what she paints is portraits and design murals mm -hmm. and things of that nature. It's all very bright and colorful and sort of celebratory, I would describe her work as, as is this mural in the museum. It, Starts at the bottom, like it said in the description, where it says, am I not a man and a brother? And there's a chain depicted behind that. And then as you travel up the mural, there is what looks like a slave ship painted on top of uh, some African designs, like kente cloth style designs, and an African mask. And then above that are some little houses, and it looks like a reward for um, perhaps an escaped slave poster. And then it says emancipation above that, and we shall overcome, referencing uh, MLK, I suppose. And then Cat's Drug Company, and then Hotel Sepia, and then, like it said in the description up at the top, are rolling green hills and a wide open blue sky. Now, I'm curious, what does the African mask actually look like? It is, it looks like a wooden carved mask. It looks a bit like the face of a bull or an ox with big round eyes and horns that form almost a circle from its forehead up to above its head. And I think there's actually more information about African masks later in this exhibit in the next section, which is about African roots. Mm -hmm. So we can come back to that probably. Uh, there's also a couple other little pieces of this lobby exhibit here. The first one says, putting African Americans to work in good jobs. And it is about a man named Charles Tony. It says, Charles Tony began working at John Deere in 1936, where he soon became the first African-American welder. In 1964, he moved to John Deere's corporate office, becoming a personnel representative. He began recruiting African-American college students from historically African-American colleges and eventually built a massive network between John Deere and these colleges. In 1972, he became the first African-American senior executive at John Deere when he was named Director of Affirmative Action. He developed and instituted many programs targeted at bringing more African-Americans into John Deere during his tenure. And there's a photograph of Charles Tony uh, standing at a file cabinet with a woman with a little page boy haircut. <laughs> it looks like they're going through files. And then below that, there is, in a glass case, his degree. It says, Charles Tony received many awards for all of his work for uh, promoting civil rights and affirmative action. In 1975, he was the first African-American to receive an honorary degree from St. Ambrose College in Davenport, Iowa. Black and white photograph of African 
American civil rights activist Charles Tony receiving his honorary degree from St. Uh, St. Ambrose. And in this photograph, Charles Tony, as a looks like middle-aged to older man, is wearing his mortarboard and robe and being handed a diploma by looks like someone who's a dean or something like that of college who's wearing a cape and a funny hat. Thank you. So mm -hmm. that's, mm -hmm. that's the one picture um, there still in the lobby. Um, or have we moved into the exhibits? There's one more in the lobby about uh, Viola Gibson, who was uh, a towering figure in Cedar Rapids from the 1940s until her death in 1989, it says. You want to hear about her? Yes, it says I it do. all started with a swimming pool. All right, in 1941, Gibson was upset to find out that her nephew was not allowed to enter the new Cedar Rapids swimming pool at Ellis Park. Blacks and whites had previously shared the beach at Ellis Park without any problems. She joined others in reactivating the Cedar Rapids branch of NAACP. And for Fiola Gibson's uh, little artifact here, it looks like her china set, her teapot and, or her creamer and sugar dish from a tea set. And it says, Viola Gibson liked to collect china. These pieces were purchased at the estate sale following her death. Right. So, okay. that's it for the things in the lobby. And it looks like the next uh, exhibit as you move on is called African Roots, African Heritage. Well, that sounds interesting. It begins with a quote from Barack Obama in Dreams from My Father, A Story of Race and Inheritance. And that quote says, the worst thing that colonialism did was to cloud our view of our past. Very true. Okay. All right, so it looks like here there is a display hanging on the wall with a map of Africa and several images, and it says beginnings. And the description that they have here says, Africa, the world's second largest continent, is over three times the size of the United States and is home to a rich variety of cultures. Great civilizations have thrived throughout Africa's long history. Several nations in West Africa flourished during the periods of European contact by facilitating trade of all kinds between the seafarers and people in the interior. Africa contains 54 countries. The climate and the landscape of the continent vary widely from north to south and from east to west. There are vast contrasts in the landscape of the continent ranging from deserts in the north and south to rainforests in the center of the continent. Okay. And then the next thing here is a mask, a wooden mask, and it looks like it's from Nigeria. It says Ngungun figure, E-N-G-U-N-G-U-N. -G -U -N -G -U -N. Mm -hmm. And it says the Yoruba of Nigeria believe that ancestors take interest in the world of the living and are a moral force with the ability to punish or bless their descendants. Masqueraders move between the worlds of the dead and the living and oversee the moral order of society. This mask with its large size and rich attire represents the spirit of an Ngungun Erin, or elephant ancestor. The Yoruba believe this ancestor can bring money, children, and other blessings to those who offer it sacrifices. The performer wearing this mask moves slowly, dancing and singing songs of blessing. And it appears that this mask is from the mid 1900s. Wow. And the way it's displayed in this exhibit, it's perched atop a like a large uh, almost mannequin it's dressed in what looks like a traditional uh, celebratory or perhaps ritualistic garb it has a big ruffle around its neck and bright colorful sort mm -hmm. of robes hanging from its body mm -hmm. and then the mask is atop there and the mask is from what i can see probably made of wood and dark and it has sort of a crude human face carved into it and then it has a beautiful headdress sitting atop it, which is uh, surrounding the crown of the head is some um, sort of like dangly gold bits. Mm -hmm. And it has orange and red fluffy parts. They might be feathers or something similar like that. And then it stands up so it looks like a couple feet off of the head of the mask. Okay. And looks to be made of cloth. It's very uh, dramatic looking. So from head to toe, it's probably, I'm imagining, six feet? That's what I would guess looking at it. Yeah, probably human, yeah. tall human sized. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And it's also surrounded by some traditional looking drums that mm -hmm. are made of wooden skin, it looks like. And there's no information here about the drums, but they look to be 
some sort of traditional African drum. Mm -hmm. And then there's another thing here about, oh, this is a mask that looks very much like the one that was in the mural. It's a, it says, Wa helmet mask. The antelope symbolizes the power of the forest. Its horns are used in magic and as charms. The Bawa people wear antelope masks during annual ceremonies and funerals to protect humans from evil spirits. And this is a wooden mask with large horns standing up off of the forehead in almost a circular uh, formation. And the face is carved as well as painted with uh, what you would picture as sort of like tribal face paint. And it says, masks in Africa have a variety of purposes, including invoking the spirits of nature, ensuring the well-being of the community and entertaining. Masks are part of agricultural celebrations, funerals, adulthood initiations, and village purification rites. These masks are all from Burkina Faso. They are made of saiba wood and decorated in geometric designs of red, white, and black. Sounds beautiful. It is, it's really lovely. Yeah. This is what I wish I could actually reach out and touch, you know, the, the, right. the value of being somewhere in person. I mean, even if you have to wear the, the gloves to touch the different pieces, um, the tactile is, is wonderful. Um, but I appreciate the description as well, so. That's what I'm here for. <laughs> So we've got the masks and we've got the paintings there. Is there anything else in this particular area? Or? That is about as much as they have online access to here in this African roots section. And then it looks like it travels into a section about the Atlantic slave trade. Mm -hmm. And so this, the quote that begins this section is from Bernice Jones in Native or in Narratives of African Americans in Iowa. And it says, the closeness of the place and the heat of the climate added to the number in the ship, being so crowded that each had scarcely room to turn himself almost suffocated us. This produced copious pers perspiration, so that the air soon became unfit for respiration from a variety of loathsome smells, and brought on a sickness among the slaves, of which many died. I think if this middle um, section or this section we're in now is actually going to give us some ideas of what the middle passage was like for them. Are, are there pictures of that? It does. It looks like there is a 3D actual representation of uh, the storage in the ships, as mm -hmm. well as some different information about the losses during the slave trade and um, things like that. And there is actually a, looks like a Google Maps 360 view of this section as well. So uh, that I'm not sure when, when you say the 360 map, how, how does that work as far as helping to enhance the experience? I mean, let's you... see how it looks when I click through to it. So I am able to make out um, some maps and diagrams from one of the exhibits on the wall about slave trade destinations and also the layout of a slave ship. Yeah, and then, mm -hmm, go on. I was gonna say, let, let's uh, see what the layout of the ship was like, just to give me some context, because that, I'm sure my imagination isn't anywhere near what it must look like. Okay. Uh, it says here they have a diagram of the plan, or sorry, the plan of the British slave ship Brooks from 1789, and that is a diagram that they got from the Library of Congress. And I just pulled up a larger version of it, and it says, stowage of the British slave ship Brooks under the regulated slave trade. Uh, the first is a diagram of the ship from the side which shows that there are two decks below the top deck that were used for storage of their human cargo. And they then go on to show diagrams of the way these decks were laid out. The first says, plan of lower deck with the stowage of 292 slaves, 
130 of these being stowed under the shelves, as shown in figure D and figure five. So um, this is a lot, but they have a layout here of one of these decks, and you can see the diagram of human figures laid out in rows, really, going from the outside walls of the ship towards the center, two rows of people laid just shoulder to shoulder, uh, long ways with their feet against the wall and heads pointing towards the center, and then another row of, it looks like, three or four people between those two heads as like the four rows meet in the center. And it, I mean, it looks like they just packed these humans in as tightly as they could, any way they could make them fit. It says that um, there were shelves above that level where they would then lay more people. And so 130 of them, of 292, were underneath these shelves. Mm -hmm. And in this exhibit, there's also, there's a 3D representation of that sort of stacking method. And it shows one man laying down on a wooden surface, and then it looks like two or three feet above him, where he's laying, is another shelf. And then there are two figures lying on top of that shelf, head to toe, um, side by side. And so they would just do that for rows and rows. Well, for context, when they departed the west coast of Africa, does it say anywhere how long it took them to get here? I, and I mean, here being uh, right. what we now know as America, but because sadly people died and clearly some survived, so. Right, there is some information here about Living and dying, definitely. Let me see if first I can find an answer to your question about how long it took, because that's a very good question. I'm just going to give that a Google real quick. Mm -hmm. you're, you're, actually, you're actually the docent and, and agent today. <laughs> These are the cool things you get to ask a docent when you're in a museum, and I, you know, I think this is awesome that we can do this online. And uh, it's a lot to take in, especially in today's climate. Um, but I, I, I think it's informative and helps to um, set the view of, again, of events of the day. And so I'm happy that you're able to help in that we've chosen this museum. I am too, I'm happy to be here. Uh, I found an answer for the Middle Passage Wikipedia page. It says that an average transatlantic journey of the early 16th century lasted several months, but by the 19th century, the crossing often required, often required fewer than six weeks. So it sounds like at least a month to, from the very beginning of the slave trade, more like several months in that condition. It's amazing. That is amazing. And does the Wikipedia say exactly where they landed, um, most of the ships? Let's see. I know that um, they're just going across the Atlantic now is probably a day from say New York to some place or West Coast of Africa, maybe more than a day, but the imagining how that would be is, well, it's hard to imagine. Right, yeah, it's, yeah, it's beyond really. Yeah. I'm not seeing an answer immediately from the Wikipedia about where they landed, but it may actually be on this museum site somewhere. So let's jump into there's a few different little blurbs here about um, the importation and sale of, of slaves. And so I'm just gonna start with the one furthest to the left, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Okay, this one says, importing and selling slaves. 
1619, a Dutch ship unloaded the first African captives to arrive in the English colonies that would later become the United States at Jamestown, Virginia. So there's a bit of an answer to that. Mm -hmm. At that time, African captives and many white Europeans served as indentured servants, freed after working for several years. Over time, indentured servitude became less common, while it became more common for African captives to be denied freedom. The Atlantic slave trade was the largest forced migration in human history. By the 1860s, at least 35,000 slave ship voyages traveled across the Atlantic on a voyage known as the Middle Passage and delivered over 10 million living Africans to the Western Hemisphere. Mm. Slave importation peaked during 1700 and 1770 with over 250,000 slaves brought to, the US, or brought to the United States alone during that period. The act prohibiting importation of slaves took effect in 1808 but many European nations participated in illegal slave trade with the United States until 1860. By the 1860s, at least 35,000 slave ship voyages had crossed the Middle Passage. That's a lot. Yeah. Um, human cargo. The Atlantic slave trade launched the largest forced migration in human history. Slave ships crossed the Atlantic, the Atlantic Ocean via the infamous Middle Passage, delivering 9 to 12 million living Africans between 1510 and the mid-1850s. An estimated 30% of enslaved Africans died during these voyages. In addition, many others died while being transported to the African coast and while waiting for ships to arrive. Portugal dominated the slave trade beginning about 1450, and France, Denmark, Holland, Spain, and Great Britain eventually wanted to be a part of this lucrative business. Um, here's a part about the deadly conditions on the ships, which we described just a minute ago. Um, an estimated 30% of enslaved Africans died during the voyage across the Atlantic Ocean aboard slave ships. Many others never even made it aboard ship and died while being transported to the African coast or waiting for ships to arrive at slave forts. This British slave ship, which is the one I described just a moment ago, um, the Brooks, the British slave ship was permitted to carry 454 sl slaves as shown in this plan. Prior to the Regulated Slave Trade Act of 1788, the ship carried between 609 and 740 slaves. The horrible conditions aboard slave ships resulted in millions of deaths. The length of the voyage varied greatly, typically ranging from one to six months, depending on conditions, weather, origin, and destination. And then there's one more thing on this page that says, the door of no return. And this is a large 3D exhibit in this room, which is an archway door that looks like it's made of stucco or something similar with exposed brick underneath where you can see the brick kind of cracking through. Mm -hmm. It says the door of no return. This portion of our exhibit is based on the doors of the slave fort on Gorvi Island off the African coast. Places such as this remain in a testament to the slave trade. Europeans built forts to use as trading posts and trading posts and holding pens. The fort on Gory Island, built by the Dutch in 1617, was constructed of bricks brought back from Europe as ship ballast. The island and fort were occupied at various times by the Portuguese, French, and English until 1763. Mm. Amazing. So I assume then that there's another um, piece to the exhibit once we've transported um, onto the shores of America? Yes, that's absolutely right. It looks like the next section uh, sort of jumps forward into how uh, enslaved and free African Americans as well were able to make a living and find peace in Iowa. Um, got to Iowa because again from my learning of history I just never heard Iowa mentioned right so yeah how, how did it happen that way let's see what it says <laughs> the quote at the beginning of this one says when you do the common things in life in an uncommon way you will command the attention of the world and that's George Washington Carver mm -hmm. all right so let me see what's the earliest thing in this example Okay, so it's 1925. Okay, so here's part 
we'll start here. So this is a section called Making a Living, which looks like it's about some various ways that African Americans ended up in and ended up making livings in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And the first one says, before the Civil War, African Americans migrated to Iowa and found employment as servants or laborers, and many settled in Mississippi River towns. From 1880 to 1920, common occupations for African Americans included coal miner, railroad worker, and manual laborers. African Americans have operated small businesses in Iowa since the 1830s. Small numbers of African American professionals begin to appear in Iowa after the Civil War. Okay. And the next section is about mining. It says Buxton Miners from the 1880 to 1920, I guess 1880s to 1920s, it's one mm -hmm. to say, coal mining. The second largest industry in Iowa was the most common occupation for African Americans. The largest number of African American miners in Iowa were located in the majority African American coal camps of Mucha Kinok and Buxton. And there's a photograph here of two young men standing side by side, leaning against a brick wall. And they appear to be pretty young, probably 20s, maybe even earlier. Mm -hmm. And it says Buxton Minus circa 1910. And the man on the left is an African American man wearing overalls, dirty overalls, and a little page boy cap. And he has looks like a cane in his hand, something he's mm -hmm. leaning on. And then standing next to him, also leaning against the wall, looking very cool, is a white man in similarly dirty coal mining clothes. Mm -hmm. So they migrated west. Um, I'm assuming after um, the Emancipation Proclamation. Yeah, and this one says before the Civil War, African Americans migrated to Iowa for to be servants and laborers. So probably both. Mm -hmm. Let me see. There's something up here too. Mm -hmm. oh, that's a 360. Let's see. So on these 360s, we again get a full view um, of what's in the um, in the room. Yeah, let me see what I can see from this one. Oh, here's a section called from emancipation to segregation, but it's not included on the little blurbs part, unfortunately. That's too bad. And then, okay, so in the 360, I can see there's um, an exhibit that is set up to look like George Washington Carver's lab Ooh. with a table with, uh, it looks like chemistry type implements on top of it. And there's also a jar of peanuts <laughs> <laughs> and his lab coat hanging from a chalkboard. And it says Iowa Roots Global Impact. And I think there is a little blurb about George Washington Carver on the main page as well. So we'll, I'll get back to that. Okay. And then the making a living section, which I just read. And the, really the main focus of this room is at the end of the room, there's a huge mural sized photograph mm -hmm. of an, a black church. And I'm pretty sure it's on the main page. Let's see. That church is the Bethel AME Church. Okay. And let's see what I can find out about that. Um, yeah, there's a whole churches section here that says African Americans expanded Christianity in their own way creating a whole new theology and style of worship. Slaves brought their religions from Africa, but were also converted to Christianity by slave owners. In the South, some slaves worshiped separately, but others were forced to attend church with their masters. In the North for a time, African-Americans attended churches with whites, but racism and a desire for their own churches led to the founding of the African Episcopal Church and the Bethel African Methodist Episcopal Church in 1794. Okay. And this photograph is of the, the Methodist church. It's a mm -hmm. black and white photograph of this large uh, peaked roof church made of bricks with a big stained glass window above the entranceway and then another peaked roof with, it looks like stone gargoyles even above the door in the front and beautiful arched windows all along the sides and gorgeous mm -hmm. brick ar architecture along the eaves of the roof, it's a really cute, classic, beautiful little church. And out front of the church is, it looks like a group of maybe 20 black people all in their Sunday finest with hats and ties and suits, and they're all gathered together in a tight little group looking at the camera. 
Okay. <laughs> it's a really lovely picture. Very nice. Very nice. Um, we've got one more section in the making a living area okay. here that's about um, African American farmers in Iowa. Mm -hmm. And it is headed Miles Dawson with Sons. It says African Americans have farmed in Iowa since it became a territory in the 1830s. In the 1850s, a number of African Americans from Illinois settled in Fayette County and formed a farming colony. After the Civil War, the number of African American farmers increased, reaching 325 by 1900. For example, the Dawson family first moved to Iowa around 1900, settling in Lee County in southeast Iowa. Seven of Miles Dawson's eight sons became farmers, and his daughters married farmers. By the 1920s, Dawson's had settled on farms throughout the southeast Iowa region. And then there's a photograph of Miles Dawson and his eight sons from 1925, and they are all sitting in two rows of five in the back and four in the front, and they're all wearing suits and ties and looking at the camera very seriously. They look like they mean business. <laughs> well, yeah. <laughs> I gotta get up early to farm. Yeah. <laughs> okay. So we uh, have... Let's see. Oh, we got one more section here about George Washington Carver and his little lab. You want to hear about him? Yes, yes, yes. All right. George Washington Carver was born a slave in Missouri during the Civil War and was raised by his mother's former owners. He left home at an early age to seek education. In 1881, he became the first African-American student at Iowa State University. After graduating from Iowa State, Carver became a well-known scientist at Tuskegee Institute in Alabama, developing new industrial uses for the soybean, pecan, sweet potato, and the peanut, and specializing in a field known at the time as chemergy but today known as biochemical engineering. Carver died in 1943. I didn't know he went to school in Iowa, did you? I did not know that. <laughs> I didn't know that I, I was, when, when you mentioned him earlier, I thought, well, I don't know the connection with him right. in Iowa. Okay, he went to school there. Okay. I didn't know that either until just I, now. Right, I, I um, somehow in my knowledge base, I didn't know he was born in Missouri. Huh. So. Well, that's good, that's good. So that's the second um, room of these exhibits. Yes, that appears to be the one about African-Americans in Iowa pre-Civil Rights Movement. And then this next one, it looks like, is about the Civil Rights Movement itself. And it says, <clears throat> the quote is from a petition against Katz Drugstore. Mm -hmm. And it says, we, the undersigned residents of Iowa, call upon you to enforce state civil rights laws which guarantee all persons the full and equal enjoyment of being served at lunch counters. We believe that such failure to comply with the law, if a challenge to the Iowa tradition of fair play, or is a challenge to the Iowa tradition of fair play, and endangers the rights of all people regardless of race, creed, color, religion, or political belief. Okay. This section is, it looks like, set up like a cat's drug company uh, lunch counter. Mm -hmm. And so it's a sort of semicircle shaped counter with stools, four stools along it that it looks like if you were at the museum itself, you could go and sit down in. Mm -hmm. And there's uh, plates and mugs and ketchup and mustard bottles and menus and everything on the counter. Mm -hmm. And then there's a menu that says chocolate milk is five cents, apple pie is 10 cents, grilled cheese is 20 cents, <laughs> chicken salad is 30 cents, and ham and cheese is 40 cents. So this was quite some time ago, it would appear. And the first little factoid here is about the Katz Drugs Company itself. It says, Katz Drug Store chain was founded by Isaac and Michael Katz in Kansas City, Missouri. And then it looks like that, if we click on that, will take us through to photos regarding this protest, which we have information about over here. So let's start with that. Okay, it says, we shall not be moved. Edna Griffin led a series of sit-ins in 1948 and 49 at the Katz drugstore that was located adjacent to an African-American neighborhood in Des Moines. She and others also circulated petitions throughout Iowa asking the governor to enforce Iowa's civil rights law. 
The cat's drugstore was targeted because the owner refused to serve blacks, even though he was repeatedly convicted of this violation. The courageous protests of 1948 to 49 finally forced him to change his discriminatory policy and serve African Americans at his Des Moines store. And there's a picture of Edna Griffin here in the 1940s. And she is smiling and writing on a notepad. And she has her hair up and an updo. And she is wearing a like military general style jacket. Mm -hmm. And it's incredible. And she also has a tie and a shirt underneath. So I'm not sure if that means that she was actually in the military or if she's just dressed mm -hmm. and fancy or what. Right. <laughs> she, she is a, herself an, an island. Yeah, so it looks like she lived in this neighborhood in Des Moines that was adjacent to Cat's Drug Store. I could look up more information about yeah. her if you'd like. Let's see. She, she, she seems to be kind of maybe, I won't say the predecessor to other civil rights movements in the 50s and 60s, but again, this is not a part of the history that I was taught. You know, what her, what her role was there in Iowa and in that... Um, context of civil rights and struggle for just equal treatment. Right. Okay, well, I found her uh, Wikipedia page. Mm -hmm. It says she was born in 1909 and died in 2000. Wow. Okay. So she was around for quite a long time. It says uh, she was an American civil rights pioneer and human rights activist known as the Rosa Parks of Iowa. Mm -hmm. Her court battle against Cat's Drug Store in Des Moines in 1948, State of Iowa vs. Cats, foreshadowed the civil rights movement and became a landmark case before the, the Iowa Supreme Court. Mm -hmm. She was born in Lexington, Kentucky in 1909, raised in rural New Hampshire, as well as Massachusetts. And she claimed she read, learned to read with access to the crisis, which was the publication of the NAACP. In 33, she attended Fisk University in Nashville, or graduated rather. And while she was at Fish, she protested against Mussolini's invasion of Ethiopia, which is how she met her husband, Stanley Griffin. Mm -hmm. They then together moved to Des Moines in 1947, and he was accepted as a student at Still College of Osteopathy and Surgery in Des Moines. Um, let's see. When she arrived in Des Moines, Griffin got involved with the Iowa Progressive Party and supported Henry Wallace in the presidential race. Mm -hmm. On July 7th, 1948, Edna Griffin, John Bibbs, Leonard Hudson, and Griffin's one-year-old daughter, Phyllis, were refused service at Cat's Drug Store in downtown Des Moines because of racial discrimination. Mm -hmm. The waitress took their order for ice cream, but after she was told not to serve them, she reported they don't serve colored people. Requesting to talk to the manager only confirms the denial of service at the establishment. Griffin launched a campaign to force cats to serve African Americans by leading boycotts, sit-ins, and pickets. She also created a committee to end Jim Crow at Cats. Mm -hmm. Griffin, Bibbs, and Hudson filed civil suits against Cats. Edna was represented by Charles Howard and Henry McKnight, members of the local NAACP, and the Polk County Attorney's Office prosecuted the Cats manager, Maurice Katz, under the 1884 Iowa Civil Rights Act, which prohibited discrimination in public accommodations. Oh, Griffin wait. testified. 1884, they had a Civil Rights Act, is that right? That's what it says, 1884 yeah. Iowa Civil Rights Act. Prohibited discrimination. Yeah, in public well, accommodations. That's very early. That, that's, now that's progressive. So yeah. They were, they were ahead in a lot of ways. Okay. Yeah, I mean, it sounds like the, uh, even the Polk County Attorney's Office was prosecuting this as early as the 40s, so that's... Yeah. Different than a lot of places you hear about. Like I'm in Louisiana and Alabama and that wasn't happening here at that time. Right. Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. So that's interesting. A lot of history. I mean, a lot of um, just factoids of information, which is why I'm so a fan of the initiative to do the um, African American uh, museums. Mm -hmm. uh, I love this idea. I love this because we can learn something we obviously didn't know. Um, the promotion is um, free for all explorers in case people are wondering if you're an explorer. I just want to just jump in and say this because I think it's really cool that uh, independent of these afternoon at the museum um, events, anyone can just pick a museum on the directory 
and call an IRA agent if you wish to do this um, through IRA and go for it. Um, and uh, this is a free promotion through the end of 2020. So I encourage people to take advantage because you think you know something um, and you learn a lot just going through the museums. Um, or you know that you don't know and you're curious and you get an opportunity through using IRA uh, agents to learn something uh, and pass away time as we're all in various stages of sheltering in place throughout at least the US and other countries. And so again, I think it's really a cool thing to be able to do this at um, no extra cost to your IRA minutes. It's a access, free access sites. So, um, but again, it's back to Iowa itself. I'm, I'm just amazed at um, how progressive they were. And again, pieces of history you didn't get, at least growing up where I grew up, didn't get this. Do you want to hear one more crazy fact about the progressiveness of Iowa in this case? <laughs> it says Griffin testified against Katz in the criminal case and the manager was found guilty by an all-white jury. Hmm. I was surprised by that as well. And then the Iowa Supreme Court upheld that conviction in 1949. So they won that case. Hmm. Hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, so that's a little bit of background about the Edna Griffin um, mm -hmm. Katz sit-in and Katz lawsuit. Uh, I actually want to just piggyback off of what you just said, Stephanie, about the museum promotion. This is a dream call for IRA agents as well. So please take advantage of it if you guys feel that you want to. Um, okay, so let's, there's a whole bunch of pictures associated okay. with this Edna Griffin situation. You want to go through those real quick sure, before we run out of time? Uh -huh. Okay, so the first one is Edna Griffin as an older lady. And she's sitting and smiling and she's wearing pearls and a very comfortable looking sweater and kind of looking off into middle distance. Mm -hmm. The second is a photograph of Kat's drugstore itself in 1941, downtown Des Moines. And it's on the front of a several stories tall brick building on the first floor. And it's all illuminated down two sides of the building with signs above that say Coca-Cola and Cat's Drugs and Fountain and uh, it looks like Rogers Theater or something like that. Rogers Twillers maybe, <laughs> some kind of other store next door. And it's very picturesque and movie-ish, like an old movie set. It sounds like this is like their downtown. Yeah, right downtown on like a busy corner. Yeah. Mm -hmm. And then there's another photograph below that of the same cat's drugs in 1940 during the day with crowds of people walking down the street out front, like just like you would picture a downtown busy city with everybody mm -hmm. milling around. And then below that, there's a photograph of Edna Griffin with, I'm not sure who she's with in this picture. She's with five men and one other woman and she and a man and another woman were seated and she's probably I don't know, maybe 30 years old in this photograph, wearing a white dress and white tights and black shoes. And she has her pocketbook in her lap and her hands are crossed oh, and she looks very poised and put together. Yeah. Well, based, then, on what you, mm -hmm. well based on what you shared with her graduation and such, she's probably post-graduate and at this point, of course, there in Iowa. Right, in Iowa, she would be yeah. late 30. 20s, 30, yeah, 30, something like that. Yeah, that's what it looks like. Mm -hmm. Uh, below that is a civil rights picket uh, photograph outside of Cat's Deli. And this is actually a photograph of a probably middle-aged white woman who is participating in the picket. Mm -hmm. And her sign says, counter service for whites only. This is Hitler's old baloney. Don't buy it, Cats." And she, it says Progressive Party of Iowa. So they must have been picketing all together. And then below that is one more photograph from that picket with, um, they all have signs similar to that. This one says the bullets work for whites only, don't buy it cats. Uh, cats serves whites only, don't buy it cats. And it's Edna herself and another black woman standing in the center and then a white man and a white woman flanking them as well. So it seems like the Progressive Party all got together to come out and picket. And this is from 1948, Pickett, outside of Cats. 
And then below that is a photograph of uh, just the picket again with, there's a grumpy looking white man walking through the center. <laughs> and then... <laughs> well, that description says it all. <laughs> I mean, you can picture it, right? <laughs> he didn't come for the picket. No. <laughs> um, one more is just a, news, a couple of newspaper clippings. And the final one is a big headline that says, Civil Rights Battle One. Cat's Drug Store lifts bars at Luncheonette. Eight civil rights cases dismissed. And then there's a ruling, a photograph of the actual ruling from the Supreme Court of Iowa that's stamped and finalized that he lost his appeal. Of them actually being served since they lost, cats lost the appeal? Hey, great question. Let me see. At this point, I don't know that I want to eat the bologna at cats, so. <laughs> <laughs> Um, no, I see a photograph of her on the 50th anniversary of the protests at a Day Moore drugstore that previously refused to serve Black customers, so she came back and celebrated the 50 year outside of the drugstore. Mm -hmm. And then... So that would put us at about 1990 or... 1998. Oh, 98, okay. So it's a couple years before she passed away, so she's very elderly in these pictures. And yeah. it looks like she looks like she's seated probably in a wheelchair because there's children okay. standing around her outside and... Yes. Mm -hmm. That's something to be celebrated. What a fight. And then downtown now in Des Moines, there is a building called the Edna Griffin Building. Okay. It was the site of the landmark civil rights protests. So now it's called after her name and there's a plaque outside about her accomplishments as well. Mm -hmm. Pretty cool. Nice wow. This is really Absolutely. I, I, I almost don't want to end. It's, it's I great. know. I'm saying, <laughs> oh my gosh, what else can we? But I, I love the protest signs. Those are great. The bullets right? were not meant for whites only. Wow. That's powerful. I mean, yeah. and imagine just coming out of World War II. You know, yeah. that, wow. Yeah. I'm, I'm, that was a good way to shake off the, the whole horror of the slave ship because mm -hmm. I don't know why, but I didn't realize they put people in horizontally. I thought people were standing up and just the thought of uh, shelves of people above your head. Uh, yeah, terrific. Uh, I mean, yeah. you, you, can't, like, you can't envision how one would, well, eat or drink or whatever. Just yeah. all of that. Is, it, it's exactly. Just, uh, and and uh, then to celebrate yeah. with something like this, you know, yeah. that's, um, that is amazing. And as mm -hmm. Stephanie noted, this particular promotion is our uh, promotion for members of the Association of African American Museums. And you can find a whole list of their museums at blackmuseums.org slash directory. Now they are doing some work on their website, so you may not be able to connect directly to each museum through that uh, web page, but you will be able to find their web pages, their names, and you can go with an agent online, or if you are lucky enough to be in person, uh, have one of these facilities that's open and is practicing safe distancing and things like that, you can have your agent uh, help you with that as you go through the physical museum through the end of the year. And I do want to reiterate, because we have the question on YouTube, you do not have to have a plan. No, um, you do not have so to have you, a plan to take can, advantage of access. You don't off. have to be a, a subscriber. You don't have to have a plan. You can be yep. um, on our, just apply the free offer mm -hmm. from your uh, home screen on your app. Yep. And you can call in and go to any of these museums. And I'll, I'll tell you. Mm -hmm. I need to start doing that. I, well, I, this was I'm, pretty awesome. I've been to a few of them, but I had not been to this one yet. So um, this is really pretty awesome. And I would say, folks, please reach out to the museum folks because they are going through a rough time right now with the storm damage and whatnot. And would definitely appreciate you reaching out to the African American Museum of Iowa. I would love to thank you so much, Stephanie, for being our host of Afternoon at the Museum. Thank you, Stephanie. Yeah. Thank you, thank you Julia. You're awesome job. Oh, Julia, that was so awesome. Thank, thank you. you. It was so much fun. <laughs> Julia is just one of our many awesome agents, and our agents love museums, folks, so bring it on. <laughs> yeah. well, now, our, yes. I just, just want to say real quickly, I 
love the idea of being able to do a lot of these um, things. If I just Google something or go on the directory myself, but I must tell anybody out there, it, go with an agent because the experience is amplified. Um, as Janine said, you know, there might be um, the sites, different sites are under construction. The agents can really help facilitate um, second and third level pages um, to get you into the museum. So please take advantage of that. Absolutely. They will get you where you need to be, including the Jazz Museum, which is pretty awesome. I am told we will be visiting that museum later in the year. So everybody get excited. Uh, in two weeks, we will have these afternoons at the museum every two weeks. And in two weeks, it will be September 11th. That's a pretty auspicious day in this country. And we're going to take a look at a museum that is outside of our uh, AAAM offer, but it is the Tuskegee Airmen Museum. And we will be looking at that with Stephanie and with one of our Black veterans, Mr. Paul Mims, who's also an explorer. So he'll be along with us on that journey with one of our agents as well. And then after that, get ready because as baseball season winds down, we are going to the Negro Leagues Baseball Museum in Kansas City. So it will be fun. Oh, that one I can't wait for either because that's going to be excited. I, you that's going to be a really cool one too. You know, and and, and, and I'm loving, guys. I, I just, I have to say it. We're getting so many, um, we're getting so many chats about, thank you so much for doing this. Uh, this is, was amazing. Thanks for coming together to provide this experience. And there's just so much love um, on YouTube. But I'm, and I'm so glad um, yes. thank to be able you to stay all. here. And um, there's, uh, during the presentation, it was, I, I'm really enjoying this, and it, it's just, I, 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 coming together and, and doing this, it's, it's such a great experience, and I, yeah. I'm so glad. I've always wanted to do museums. It's always been, like, the thing that I've always wanted to do. <laughs> right. Um, yeah. Just even yeah. before Ira, right? You know, you go oh, to yeah. a museum, and uh, you'll go to these museums, and it's, oh, there's a lot of things that you can't touch or you can't yep. experience. Mm -hmm. And I yeah. think, and and when you go in, you you're like, ah, I want to know. I mean, I remember going to, going through field trips back at school and wanting to mm -hmm. know more about it and getting to yeah. experience this now yeah. with Ira. It's just oh, so it's awesome. unique and amazing. So Absolutely. thank you everybody who joined us today. Yes, we really appreciate this. I'm sorry, Stephanie. Just, uh, just a quick jump in plug because we're touring and. Uh, Few weeks uh, Jackie um, I'm sorry uh, Negro Baseball League mm -hmm. today Major League Baseball is uh, celebrating Jackie Robinson Day it's normally April 15th today because of the uh, COVID and all of all the yeah. oh, wow celebrating that. this is quite an auspicious day I was going to say this is quite an auspicious day oh my goodness day. we had the, the <laughs> 57 right, they today. right. I, and, I, and I, in the shortened season and everything going on and especially with everything going oh, wow. on um, that uh, please if you can just take a moment to um, honor Jackie Robinson even if teams don't play honor Jackie Robinson mm -hmm. Absolutely. Said. MLK, Jackie Robinson. Yeah, and Just today so is many. the virtual yeah. march on Washington, yes. 57th anniversary of the I Have a Dream speech. Yes. And folks, if you have not done so, listen to the whole speech, the entire speech, because it is so powerful. It really is. And really should so. resonate with us today. Yeah. Well, I want to thank everyone. We will be back at 4 p.m. Eastern Time, 1 p.m. Pacific Time on September 11th with the Tuskegee Airmen Museum. And this particular episode will also be up here on our YouTube channel. So have your friends and family uh, come and check it out. We'll also have the audio version of this on our podcast, IRACAST, that's A-I-R-A-C-A-S-T, in your favorite podcast player. And for Ira, I am Janine Stanley, joined by my co-pilot, Ryan Bishop. Thank you, everybody. It was such a pleasure getting to experience this with you, and I hope you have a great Friday. Great. Thank and our Ryan. wonderful host. Yes, Miss Stephanie Watts. Thank you so much, Stephanie. You're welcome. Thank you all.
we are going to thank Julia so much for joining us and giving us the experience of what it's like to go to a museum with an IRA agent. I really felt like I was there, actually. It was, it was my like, pleasure. I really did, too. It was, it was uh, wonderful. Thank yeah. you so much. Great job, Julia. <laughs> thank you so much. Thank you, Stephanie. Take care, everyone. Everybody have a wonderful weekend.